All right, I think we're just gonna give folks uh, another minute or so. I see um, a lot of you just joined as we have to let everyone in through the Zoom. This is Shafkat speaking. Um, so I just wanted to welcome everyone and we'll get started in about a minute. All right, so I think it's about two minutes past uh, time, so we'll get started. Again, thank you everyone um, for joining. This is uh, Shafkat speaking. I'm the co-founder and CEO of NewsCred. I'm uh, super excited uh, today to um, have a guest that I think is very unique, uh, not only because she's an excellent analyst, but also has lived and uh, she's breathed ex uh, like the entire experience that we're going to be talking about uh, comes from industry, has a lot of experience uh, on the marketing ops side. And so, you know, a, re a real true expert. Um, and so welcome, Marsha. Uh, excited to have you. And I'll, I'll let you introduce yourself in a second. Um, just as a reminder to everyone, um, you know, this is a more of an interactive session that we're going to do. It's called Ask an Analyst. Um, and really the topics are around marketing collaboration and how do we drive efficiency um, and, and really talking about the process side of marketing. Um, and uh, we're gonna make process fun today. So maybe before I dive into the agenda, Marsha, do you wanna just very quickly introduce yourself? Absolutely, Shafkat, and thank you so much for having me today. Um, I'm really excited to be having this conversation with you and, and all the folks who are joining us. Um, as you said, my name is Marsha Trask. I'm an analyst with Serious Decisions Marketing Operations Strategy Service. And um, I've been a, an operations practitioner in the B2B space, primarily in technology, uh, for uh, over 25 years, so I'm old. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and for folks who aren't familiar with uh, Forster and Serious Decisions, um, Serious Decisions helps B2B sales, marketing, and product leaders um, create strategies for turning their future vision into a reality. And Serious Decisions helps people do that by providing, you know, very actionable framework, best practice guidance, and hard data to help people make decisions as they make their vision a reality through operationalization and execution. Awesome. Well, thank you for that. And I think, Marsha, you, you're going to kick us off, but maybe I'll just quickly touch on the agenda, which is the next slide. Um, you know, we wanted to uh, do a couple, I think three very quick audience polls through Zoom just to make this more interactive. Uh, I don't yeah. think anyone wants to just come up and hear uh, Marsha or myself speaking for an hour. So uh, we'll do some uh, three very quick, fun polls just to see kind of uh, where you guys are on, on your journey, what your pain points, what your challenges are, especially in kind of this new normal that we live on, live in. Um, then Marsha will kick us off. Uh, I think a lot of you are here to hear our, um, kind of her insights. And then we'll do some live Q&A where you can uh, submit questions live through Zoom uh, and we'll take them, uh, whether it's questions for me on the technology side or questions for Marsha on process and um, uh, overall marketing collaboration. And then maybe we'll wrap up with one minute on news cred and, you know, some of our kind of solutions uh, that, that we offer for, um, you know, for the problems that we're going to be talking about and the challenges that we're going to be talking about. So if we move to the next slide, I think we have some of the polls. So uh, you should in your Zoom, if all goes well, I think this is the first time I'm trying it, um, get a poll uh, that has come up on your screen. Uh, so kind of in this new normal of working remotely, what, which process, when it comes to a marketing process, uh, do you think has been kind of the most difficult to manage um, in this remote world? So uh, take your time and read through it. So these are different marketing processes. So whether it's planning, uh, managing budgets, creating content, um, you know, measuring either like operational efficiency, so how well you're working as a team or measuring kind of the results of campaigns, like what's been most difficult for you, so. 
I'm going to answer mine as well and submit. Uh, I think uh, Anthony and our team is going to put up the results as soon as uh, we get answers. And here we go. So this is the result. Uh, number one is integrated campaigns, planning integrated campaigns. Marsha, any surprise for you or? As no, it, it, if anything, the surprise is that the that's not a little bit higher. Um, that's certainly something we hear from our clients. That's that's always a, a perennial pain point, and it's it's exceedingly challenging now that teams are so distributed. Yep, makes sense. And I think we're going to be talking about kind of integrated planning and 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 how best to optimize kind of those integrated campaigns, which are more important, but as you said, harder than ever before. Number two um, is when it comes to collaboration specifically, <coughs> um, what's been the biggest challenge? So um, now we're, we're kind of zooming in one level into collaboration. Is it visibility into what other people and teams are working on? Is it lack of tools? Is it, you know, priority shift because of COVID or just too many new inbound requests and having to pivot on a dime? Or is it undocumented processes? So I'm going to answer mine. All right. So Anthony, when you're ready. Um, mm, yeah. <laughs> Shifting priorities. Do you want to speak to that surprise or not a surprise? No, again, really not a surprise. I know the last quarter has been hard for a lot of uh, marketing organizations because, you know, uh, this is a time of a lot of major events and things that have been planned for a while and suddenly that ground has shifted under everyone's feet. So, um, again, something we're hearing a lot from our client base that people have had to pivot quickly. Yeah, what's interesting here is that um, – we talk about marketing agility and, and having it being agile and using maybe agile principles in marketing. And we've been talking about this for years, but the last quarter has really kind of up the urgency. It's been a forcing function for marketing teams to discover how truly agile they and nimble they can be as the world shifts around them. So let's go to poll number three. This is the last one. So specifically about technologies, you know, what have you found uh, or started using more or has been really important for you to facilitate kind of re remote collaboration across your marketing organization? I've gone in and submitted mine. No bias there, right, Chavkat? <laughs> I actually, yeah, I tried not to choose like CMP. Okay, wow, 28%. That's pretty good, CMP. Um, I actually chose video conferencing just to give away my answer. Well, you clearly were not alone. Yeah. And this has been, I mean, I think Zoom's stock price kind of shows how critical video conferencing has been. To me, you know, uh, Marsha, before I hand over to you to talk about kind of your, your slides and go through your insights, um, I will say while video conferencing has been absolutely essential and I can't imagine going through this type of COVID experience in a non-video world, personally, it doesn't, it still doesn't replace the serendipitous kind of creative brainstorming that used to happen in the office. And so yeah, I think that we may even get to one of these questions at the end. I'm, I'm curious how we replace that. And I have some thoughts that I'll share at the end. But uh, over to you, um, eager to hear what you have to say. And then if for the audience, please do think about questions, submit them through the Q&A section. Uh, for those of you who pre-submitted questions, uh, we'll certainly be taking some of those as well. So over to you. Great. Well, thank you again, and uh, thank everyone for joining today, especially since we're going to be talking about, you know, best-in-class process and collaboration. Um, process is a word that it's really interesting. It's like the one swear word in marketing. Um, if you want to see a group of marketers shut 
louder, just say, hey, everyone, we're going to talk about process or, or to, to quote my Canadian friends, process. Um, it really is something that, that makes people a little uncomfortable. And I wanted to, to dig into that and, and really think about that. And, and if you look at the definition of process, it's really nothing so terrible. It's, it's a systematic series of actions or steps or tasks that you take that are directed to some specific end. Um, so really not something that, that inherently is, is very traumatic, um, but it is something where there's a lot of pain in marketing. And you know, a lot of people say, oh, if I could do my job so much better if I didn't have all this process in the way and, and process is bad. But actually we put process in place for a reason. And um, you know, one of the things that I like to think about it and say is that the absence of process is not efficiency, it's chaos. Um, because look at, look at what process process gives us. Um, if, we, if we have a good process and we're using it, it's allowing us to reduce waste. Um, we're not, you know, duplicating marketing efforts. I, I worked with a client years ago and literally um, the corporate team and the European team were booking roadshows in Europe on the same topic in the same week. And the only reason they found out about it, because they didn't have a good communication process, process uh, was that the EMEA team tried to book a hotel that the America's team was already using for an EMEA for a VMware event. Sorry, I just spilled the client name. It's been a while. Um, and they were all shocked uh, because they were duplicating efforts. So if you have a good process, it helps reduce waste. Um, process can also yield efficiency and effectiveness across the organization. Um, you get uh, enforced collaboration. And if you have good handoffs and you're um, working in fairness and partnership with other people across marketing, it, it can build trust. Um, process allows us to have greater measurement and insight. Think about all the work that goes into measuring and providing insight into your waterfall process or your, your lead funnel. Um, if you didn't have a process, you wouldn't be able to see how you're progressing, what you're actually accomplishing. And as we touched on at the beginning of the webinar, if you have good process in place, that's going to stand you up and set you up so that you can start to apply some agile methodology and become more nimble and more effective. There's also a financial impact to process. And um, this information is based on a study Serious Decisions did a couple of years ago on the economic impact of alignment. And what we found is that overall organizations, not just marketing, but the, the bigger corporation or bigger company you work for, that there's three main drivers for actual tangible financial growth. One of them is the growth of your overall market, and that's out of your control. That's a rising tide lifts all boats. That's the video conferencing vendors in today's environment. Um, you know, and that that percentage of impact on your growth is very large. It can be 48 to 79 percent. There's another category that helps you with growth, and that's your internal competitiveness and efficiency. You know, are you able to do things in a better or faster way? Are you resolving client or customer needs better? That can drive 12 to 34% of your growth, and a lot of that is in your control. But the one area that absolutely 100% is in your control and can drive anywhere from 5 to 36%, again, I'll say that, 36% of your overall company growth is how aligned you are internally in terms of your communications and your internal processes. So it's impactful. It actually does translate hard dollars down to your bottom line and your stock price. But process isn't perfect and we've all lived through this pain. Um, everyone has processes or been in, in environments where it's like, I, I don't understand why we have this process. Or this thing is so darn convoluted, I don't even know who it serves anymore. It certainly doesn't serve me as a stakeholder. Um, or it's a process that's not really providing value any longer. Maybe it did once and things have changed. Um, or I hear this a lot from clients. I hate this process. It creates redundant work. I have to do data entry over and over and over again. It's not helping. Um, we have situations where the process isn't clear, it's too manual, way too many exceptions. You know, oh, it's Tuesday, you can bypass this. Oh, oh you're so-and-so, you can bypass it. That's not fair to anyone. Um, and that's another problem that process can have, where the work isn't fairly distributed. It's not really an efficient process if it routes everything to one or two people or one team to solve. Um, processes can get out of date as your organization changes, as your routes to market change, as you introduce new things. Um, and a lot of times processes are very poorly communicated 
and they're not enabled. Um, I always think of the example of uh, someone joining an organization as a salesperson. They are given in-depth training. Here's the sales process. Here's how you generate an RFP. Here's how you register a deal. All of this information is shared with them. If you're a marketer and you're joining the same company, you're handed a laptop and you're told to go figure it out. Um, we historically as marketers don't do a very good job of enabling or communicating our internal process to people. So that adds a layer of problem and that's when people start to shudder when they hear that P word. So I run into a lot of clients who say, well, to heck with it, we just, we'll just abolish process. It's bad. And that's when we end up with that. The absence of process is not efficiency, it's chaos. Um, a lot of times we see people wanting to skip process or blaze through it. It's all about speed. We've got to go faster. We've got to be, you know, just really, really crank on this. And the results are often suboptimal. Um, like a lot of people out there, I've been experimenting with quarantine baking and I'm, I'm not a natural baker. And I've learned you have to follow the process and you have to follow the steps. And when they say, let things cool before you frost them, they're not kidding. Um, going faster isn't the answer. Um, it, it, it comes out with a suboptimal result. You know, another example is people want to skip steps. Oh, this is this process is so complicated. I'm just going to skip a bunch of steps and race to the end again. And you oftentimes can end up with something that doesn't quite look what you intended or it's a little shakier and you've got a bunch of mystery spare parts, um, kind of ominous. Again, often a suboptimal result. And Another time is you know, we also see the maverick. I don't need the process. I'm going to go off and do my own thing. I don't need to collaborate. I got this. I can figure it out. Well, again, you can end up with some unintended results, uh, aka home hair coloring, again, in a pandemic situation. Um, processes exist for a reason. Uh, they, they help you get to the result that you want, involving the people that you want, and not missing critical pieces of information that you're trying to get to. And the other thing that I always think is very ironic is that marketers tend to be allergic to process, and yet it is so critical to the success of the marketing organization. And if you think about marketing, we're one long series of processes. Um, regardless of what your marketing organization structure looks like um, or the teams that you have, ultimately in marketing, we're charged with coming up with a strategy, developing plans, designing campaigns or programs, building out our tactics, activating them in the market, measuring if they're working or not, and then learning from that and iterating. So it's, it's fundamentally marketing itself is a big process loop. And if you dig a little deeper under that, you start to see that under each of these big buckets, we have tons of process. So think about setting strategy. You've got to go through a process to scope and size your market and segment it. There's process work that goes around figuring out what your competitors are doing or determining what your product roadmap is going to be or your financial goals. And if you look at this throughout all of marketing, it's all built on a series of important processes. You've got your marketing planning process. I'm sure everyone here on the call is painfully familiar with that and with your budget and resource allocation processes. You have processes around, you know, extending your brand or developing new programs or figuring out what your annual event schedule is going to be. Tons of process around product launch. Um, when we get into the build phase, tons of process around developing your content, developing your assets, creative production, localization, um, you know, managing different projects, managing your agencies and vendors. I mean, it's, it's process all throughout this. And so it's, again, it's funny that process uh, in terms of the marketing world is, I call it kind of the red haired stepchild under the stairs. Um, everyone wants to talk about adding talent or really adding great new technology, um, but nobody really wants to look at process. And it's, it's so core and fundamental to what we do. That doesn't mean, however, again, that it's perfect. Um, I see working with clients a lot of points of process failure. Um, you know, it's constantly evolving. We all live in a very fast paced business world and we're dealing with lots of changes, you know, such as a global pandemic. Um, so things change. 
but we're not very great at keeping up with the communication or documenting or training as things change. Um, process has a lot of unclear roles and responsibilities across marketing. Nobody really can point to say, hey, who owns this? Um, we know people who participate, but we aren't always clear what's required of them. Like, you do this and you get this in return. Um, in fact, most of the time, um, it, it's nebulous. No, no one's sure who owns or what they're supposed to do. Um, handoffs and service level agreements is another point of process failure. I'm, I'm going to wager, a little private wager with myself, that right now, for most of the folks on this call, if you have any defined handoffs or service level agreements, it's all around one process, um, your, lead, your lead flow, your funnel, your, your lead management. Um, and that's because you have to have service level agreements with your tele uh, or SDRs or BDRs and your sales team. But there are so many other processes in marketing and the handoffs are, are unclear and there aren't SLAs or if they are, they're assumed, they're not written down, um, which also makes it very challenging. Um, we also struggle with inputs and outputs in marketing process. I see this a lot with clients who are, um, you know, cleaning up or adopting agile for things like web development or their content or creative processes. Um, everyone struggles with briefs. Everyone struggles with intake forms. Um, you either don't get the information you need or they're over architected and um, too complicated and stakeholders bypass them. And we also kind of run in constantly to unrealistic and unestablished timelines. Um, you know, who hasn't gotten a last minute request? Um, I need a I need a 60 page white paper and I'd like it tomorrow. It, it's how realistic is that? Um, but there, there really isn't a sense of how long things take to produce. Um, reviews, this is another area where process breaks down. And uh, my observation here is that it's generally are, you often have too many people involved in reviews, they're at the wrong level of the organization, or the reviewers don't have clear guidelines. They just go in and look at something and go, oh, I don't really like that photo, or I'm not a fan of purple. Well, are you looking at it from a brand perspective? or a legal trademarking perspective, or a messaging perspective, or you know, what is your role? What are you contributing to this review? Um, so that's, that's another area where process gets painful. And then governance. Um, other than, again, the lead management process, you don't see a lot of governance in marketing. Because again, it's that P word, and then you add in the G word, and oh my gosh, this is scary. Um, but it, it causes problems for people who have to use these processes. Um, there's no formula or mechanism for feedback to say, hey, you're having me enter the same information four times. Can we, can we fix this? Um, or this process is truly broken. Who do I talk to to fix it? Um, and that's a problem. And again, organizations I work with who are starting to adopt Agile, a lot of this is becoming surfaced as they do things like sprint retrospectives and realize that, hey, we're trying to go fast and we have a process itself that's really muddled and we have to fix this if we're going to truly get to agility. Now, hey, Mark, this is being, uh -huh. So there was a question um, that came in sure. that is related to this last slide, and I think you kind of answered it, which is uh, getting getting the marketing team who may already be pro process involved here is is often easier. But when you have workflows that include departments outside of marketing uh, to move process forward, it's often harder. Like, how do you recommend getting those individuals on board from outside of marketing? Is your recommendation to like kind of flipping these chat pain points into into like solutions? So make roles clear, make sure people know who own and who drives the process. You said something that I thought was interesting, which is if people know what they have to put in and what they'll get out, they're, they'll be more motivated. But often they don't know. So any any feedback around like how do you get non-marketing individuals on board? And sorry if I'm interrupting your flow. Oh, no, not at all. This is intended to be interactive. Nobody wants to hear me monologue. Um, so that is a fabulous question. And what I, the way I've approached that with clients and, and in my past life as a practitioner is um, the golden rule of WIFM, uh, which is the shorthand for what's in it for me. And it's really coming to whoever is outside of marketing and saying, look, you know, if, if there's involvement, if we, if we involve you in this process, here's what's in it for you. Um, finance is a great example. I've done a lot of work with finance around marketing budget, allocation, spend management, and it's really developing that as a partnership. 
So look, finance, we need you. We need you to release the funds. <laughs> Clearly, this is really important for marketing. You need things from us, especially if you're in a public company situation. You need marketing to be able to tie off and, and finalize spend on a monthly or quarterly basis so the company can report. Um, you know, it's got to be a win-win partnership. And then sit down and talk to stakeholders on both sides to say, look, bottom line, what is it you really need you know, from us? And what is it we really need from you? And how can we streamline the way so that we can both get what we need from this and then communicate it to others? Like finance isn't asking you to fill this out because they're trying to torture you. They realize that you are very busy. You're running 12 events this year or this quarter. Um, they're doing it because we have to do this from an accounting perspective or there's, there's a legal requirement. So how can we make you doing this easier so that both sides are happy? Um, it's, it's not a silver bullet, but I've really found if you approach people openly and say, look, we've got to make this work for both of us. We both need each other. How can we make sure that the what's in it for you is clear? It, it generally helps the process. Great. Love it. Develop the process. Thank you for taking that. Let's keep going and then I'll sprinkle in some more questions as you go along. No worries. Well, this is this is kind of a fun slide we're going to here. So um, back early on when uh, Anthony and I first started talking and, and he invited me to participate in the call today, um, we got into a really impassioned conversation around the concept of the, the people process technology triangle. And I think most everyone here is familiar with it. It's, it's a nice lens to look at solving your problems operationally. And if you look at how marketing and business has grown over the last 10, 15 years, um, a couple of, of angles of this triangle have been used very aggressively. So if you think about people um, in marketing for the, in the last 10, 15 years, there is just a hunger for specialized skills in marketing. And we've seen the rise of this. I, I can't tell you how many times I've had someone approach me and say, wow, I'm really looking for um, a, a super skilled, um, senior Marketo admin, or insert any other name of marketing technology here, um, who, who's got like 10 years experience and they're also like a mad Salesforce admin and I want them to know how to do really good demand programs and they need to start tomorrow. And I always laugh and say, take a line, you know, take a number because there's a line out the door. Everyone's looking for that. Um, so we've had a lot of specialized skills development and that's been encouraged in the last 10, 15 years. In some regions, there's owl and out talent wars. Obviously, that's probably a little different right now given the pandemic. But you know, I've seen people bit, get into bidding wars for talent in, in tight markets. Um, and similarly, you know, they're putting retention programs in place because they want some of this super skilled talent to stay with them and not go somewhere else. So that's that's a side of the triangle that's seen a lot of action. Um, technology. Uh, um, goes without saying, the last 10, 15 years, the technology space for marketing has completely exploded. Um, I know you've, you've had some um, webinars in the past with Scott Brinker. Um, I attended the MarTech conference this past year, and, you know, they're up to something like 7,000 vendors in our space. It's crazy. Um, we're putting money into this. There's an explosion. Um, CMOs now get together and trade details on their MarTech stack like you know baseball cards um it's it's again it's an area where there's just been all this energy and emphasis and for process eh, not 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 really being used um what i see now given the environment we're in there is a huge opportunity to drive some efficiency and effectiveness in marketing by revisiting you know blowing the dust and the cobwebs out of this corner of the triangle and really taking a hard look at how can i optimize the people in the technology that i have today through process because again what i'm seeing out there and this is obviously still unfolding i'm seeing budgets for hiring being frozen you know sadly there have been restructurings and, and people who've been let go. Um, we're, we're seeing technology budgets, not completely frozen, but they're certainly being scrutinized and, and no one's really gonna say, hey, I'm gonna give you a million dollars to go off and build fantastic new things in this current environment. Um, so really in terms of a lever that you can strategically use to drive improvements and growth in your organization is about process. You know, how do I, how do I pivot my event process to it be in a digital environment? How can I repurpose dollars from one area into another area? How can I streamline the ability to get work done when my team is now working remotely at home in their pajamas and is likely going to be for the foreseeable future? 
maybe not in the pajamas, but working from home. <laughs> so th there's a lot of opportunity here. And I finally think this is, you know, poor little forgotten process. It's, 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 it's time to be in the spotlight and shine a little bit as people are trying to be smart and use the resources they have to accomplish their goals today. I love this, oh. by the way, because there's a lot of marketing ops folks on the line and you know, they <laughs> often own process and it is a time to shine. Actually, if you don't mind, just before you move off this slide, you, you mentioned, um, you know, Scott Brinker and, you know, that, that list. There was a question about, like, do you believe that MarTech has risen to the challenges that, you know, you're talking about process or you think it has not? Like, any, any thoughts on that? Oh, another excellent question. Um, so, yes, there is definitely some fantastic technology out there to help people with collaborative work um, with, with developing content, with developing assets. There, there's great technology that's out there. The, the challenge that I have seen and, and lived has been there is typically a mindset to say, we bought a cool tool mm -hmm. and we're gonna implement this really cool tool. And we're just gonna take our existing process and automate it. <laughs> and what that gives you is you're doing a bad process faster. Um, and again, because process is sort of non-sexy, you know, people are like, oh, this is great. And it's got these features and this functionality. And they don't think about how do we, how do we optimize and work with it, um, even to the point of, of enabling people on the technology. Um, one of the companies I was uh, recently with before I, I stepped back into an analyst role were paying a very premium price for a piece of technology that had been in-house for three years and one person knew how to use it. Um, again, they, they, were, they were very excited about the bells and whistles. They really hadn't thought, how's this going to fit? Who's going to use it in our organization? What processes is it going to support? And it wasn't until the, the contract came up for renewal and everyone went, we're putting a lot of money into this, we aren't really using it, that they finally dug in and said, oh, here's where it can start to add value. And now it's a very successful implementation. But technology alone isn't the answer. So there, there are tools out there to help you with, to collaborate, to, to improve your process, but you have to think about the process as you use those tools. Totally agree. One of the, the biggest determinants of success for onboarding for anyone who it, it implements uh, NewsCred's uh, work management solution or our content marketing platform is if they just try and take their existing offline workflows and digitize them and end up with a very long-winded, inefficient, cumbersome 20-step process that just happens to be in a cool workflow tool, uh, to your point, it, it's not going to be very successful. But the ones that are successful are the ones who use it as a forcing function to revisit and ask the question, hey, why do we do things this way? And often the answer, as you know, is, well, because it's always been done this way. Right. And use kind of the implementation of new MarTech as a way to challenge some of those preconceived notions, challenge their blind spots, and relook at, you know, how do we change kind of the process? And then the tool just helps implement that new process. Exactly. And, and I often approach uh, new technology as really an opportunity to take a hard look at process. Um, when we were waiting for the call to start, you mentioned that I had done a big uh, MRM, marketing resource management uh, implementation in my past for a, a Fortune 1000 company. And we, simultaneously, as we went down the, the vetting and looking at all the vendors that were available, I was running, um, I was a senior marketing ops manager at the time, I was running a parallel effort where I brought together a cross-functional team across, you know, of marketing representatives from multimedia, from our content team, from the different campaign teams, everybody, to really map out what's our process today, where does it fall down, how can we make it better? So by the time we'd gone through and got approval and, and made an, a, a contract with a vendor, we had done all that process thinking so we could get right into implementation. Great, thank you. Let's keep going. Yeah, no worries. Um, so what I wanted to follow up with here is, is there is a lot of opportunity to dust off, to look at process, to make it shine. And I wanted to give some practical guidance for that. Um, one of the easy things to do that's low or no cost um, is really just take a look at your process today and say, do we clearly have it defined? Do we have checklists? Do we have how to's? Um, and if we don't, this is a great time to document and publish that because people are remote. You can't just wander down to, you know, Joe or Mary's cubicle and say, how do I do this again? 
it needs to be written and it needs to be published and people need to be able to find that. Um, and it needs to be current. Processes do change, they get out of date. And communicate it, share it with everybody. Hey, I know we're working remote. Uh, we've got a new quarter coming up. Here's again how you uh, bring on a new vendor or how you handle your accruals or how we close out uh, the books for the quarter, whatever that process is. Make sure people are aware of it. Um, it's also a fantastic time to really take a hard look at what where, what are our processes and are they operating the way they need them? You know, do we have gaps? Do we have redundancies? Where can we streamline? Where can we make it better? And talk to people, um, you know, have that, have those conversations and think about building some racy models or daisy models or, or any kind of decision support, which basically says, hey, this is the person who owns it. Here's who's, who's part of this process. Here's what we need them to do. Here's who we keep informed. It, it's pretty straightforward. Doesn't have to be complicated documentation. Now, this next suggestion is involving a little bit more um, spend, but as people are repurposing budgets because of environmental changes. Um, but you can take a hard look at, do you have processes that you can automate right now? Um, another thing we're seeing clients do, if this isn't already happening in your organization, is actually have some formal project manager or program manager roles. A lot of them are reporting into operations teams um, where you're starting to get some standardized this is how we approach process. These are the checklists. We're going to make sure the work is happening. Um, and you know, it's a great time to invest or take a hard look at a project management or a collaborative work or an MRM system. What I will caution people, and I'm, I'm currently working with a client who I'm trying to talk off a ledge, um, there's a strong tendency for some reason when you're talking about project management or collaborative work tools, somebody always gets the idea that, hey, we can build our own. Um, we, we've got SharePoint, we've got Slack, we got Jira, we can tie something together. In 25 years, I've never seen this end well. Um, and this one client I'm working with is putting a lot of effort in. They're actually getting a low code tool and they're coding some things. And it sounds fun and maybe you like to tinker, but it never scales. Um, the minute IT changes one of those backend systems, all the work you've done is in a, in, in a dust heap. It's really hard to keep maintained. Um, you basically have to hire your own development team to keep it up and running, and it's hard. Um, Jacquette, you can probably say how hard it is to build these kind of tools. So um, I just caution people. It, it sounds like, oh, we've got some pieces of this. We could tie it all together. Be very, very careful. <laughs> yeah, I've spent 10 years of my life with hundreds of engineers <laughs> trying to build this thing. So agreed. It's, it's hard. Um, it's also a great opportunity now to take a hard look at some of the formal process methodologies that are out there. I'm seeing a lot of interest in our clients who are, you know, they've been dabbling with Agile, you know, either a, a Kanban scrum or some kind of hybrid model. They're looking at lean, you know, how do we cut waste out of the process? Um, and, and people who have dabbled with it are now looking at the, the COVID situation as an opportunity to say, wow, we really need to get more disciplined about this. How can we, how can we jumpstart or reinvigorate our adoption of Agile? And that that's something that I'm, I'm hearing about every day from our client base. And, and it is, it's a, it's a great opportunity um, to use this sort of time while the markets are a bit in turmoil to think about how do we get better at doing what we do. Um, I want to speed this up a little because I want to make sure we have plenty of time for questions. But basically, why don't we invest in process? We've proven it's important. We know that marketing is very involved in it. And typically with the responses like, oh, it's boring. You know, or it's too complicated. I, I have my team. I don't know what these other teams are doing. Processes cross teams. If it's just I don't even want to wade into that. Um, or you know, it's really hard. It's hard to make a business case to get resources or time to put some effort in process, and and it can be hard to measure success. So you know, this is kind of the what we hear from people who are not don't really want to go into that that process corner of the triangle. But I will tell you, your marketing leadership is thinking hard about process these days. Um, this is a part of a survey we run every year with our CMO group. And we asked them, what internal processes are you struggling with and what are the ones that you wanna improve? And this is the results we're getting back. I mean, marketing strategy and planning, broken in so many organizations, people wanna fix this. New product introductions, market segment and prioritization, integrated campaigns, tying back to our first poll, you know, managing the budget, managing measurement. All of these are major processes and people are realizing, I've got to put some focus and effort in on this. So trust me, leaders are starting to think about this as an area that needs to be improved. 
And there's a lot of value for driving process improvements. And, and I tend to group these in three categories. You know, the first is around better just work results. Um, and if you do some process improvements, especially some of the improvements I'm seeing from teams that adopt Agile, you can get incredible uh, predictability and efficiency and better quality results. Um, I just did a case study with one client uh, where they adopted Agile and did some process improvements on their content team for a global enterprise software company. And they cut their asset production time 73% like seven, three percent. That was huge. And their business results went up because they were now optimizing their content for SEO keywords as they developed it. And they had a 28% uptick in a single year uh, in terms of inbound uh, based on SEO. And the SEO leads that came in were much higher quality, much better conversion rate. Um, there's also a hard dollar element to process improvement. Um, you're reducing waste. You know, you're reducing people's wasted time, their money, cycles, all of that you're reducing. Um, you're getting better uh, insights and transparency to drive further improvements. And also in the case of things like when we all had to build a GDPR process very quickly, um, you can reduce business risk or, or avoid financial penalties. There's also soft benefits to process improvements. And again, going back to the client I just did a case study on, um, they dropped um, voluntary attrition significantly on this very highly skilled asset and content team um, because people were so much happier day to day. They, they, they had control over their work. They got the information they needed to get the work done. They were able to turn it around. Stakeholders were happy. Everybody was happy. So there was you know, certainly more efficient collaboration. People on the team had a much increased job satisfaction and they dropped their, you know, their attrition rate. So very powerful story. And um, measurement, this is an area, again, people struggle with. I'm not gonna go into this deeply because I wanna allow time for questions, but what we coach clients on is thinking about if you're trying to drive some internal measurement improvements, three big lenses to look at is, is this helping you with your overall business objectives, which could be things like efficiency or compliance if you're in a legislated industry or performance improvement. You can actually look at how the process itself improves. You know, are we getting better training on it? Are we utilizing our budget or our resources better? Are we hitting our milestones? You can also look at the lens of team adoption or internal adoption. Are people starting to use it? Are your ticket complaints dropping? Are you seeing improved job performance or satisfaction? So these are very large buckets to think about how you can track and, and draw some measurement around process improvement. And with that, um, I would love to open the door for more questions. Um, have, have any come in additionally that we'd like to address? Yeah, first of all, awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, also got a lot of good feedback from folks that they're loving your presentation. Um, I will actually just go ahead and share my screen and just put it up. Uh, one, so I already, Marsha, I, I, I know you were trying to go fast to get to the questions, but I already uh, peppered you with two or three of the questions that came in to make it interactive. So I think we're doing a good job there. Uh, awesome. getting Getting to them. One question we got from folks, I guess, before the, before the um, webinar, what, and I'm going to combine two or three of them into one, which is just around like, all right, so marketing teams are now working from home. Like, how do you think companies are going to use remote work going forward? I guess this is kind of an opinion questions. Um, and then related to that, any tips around like, you know, there was a question on how do you break down silos when you, without having too many people in meetings? Um, is there good ways to onboard new people while you're working from home? So like, I would kind of bucket the questions into any just guidance from this new work from home reality that, that you have and any tips that you have. No, it's, it's, it's certainly very topical. Um, so a couple of things. I think as we are all working from home and having to be in a distributed environment, um, it really comes down to, uh, communication is so critical and it's it really is a is a time to make sure people have clarity on what it is we're asking them to do here's how you get the work done here's the tools that are at your disposal um, and, and I can actually add a, a little personal slant on that so I um, rejoined Sirius joined Forrester at the height of the pandemic 
And I was onboarding as a new employee completely remotely. And I was incredibly impressed with the, the detail of information that was shared to me on, uh, here's how you access this. Here, here's where you look for that. We're going to take time and we're going to walk you through these steps to show you, um, you know, this is, the, this is the review and approval process as you submit research. Um, so it was just, you know, I get the sense that they do a great onboarding all of the time, but given that it was distributed, they went the extra mile. They really wanted to make sure that I was set up to succeed working in a remote environment. Um, so I would just say that that's a general rule of thumb is, is one, I don't think working from home is going to go away anytime soon. Um, uh, personal opinion, I don't think it's going to change radically until we, we have a, a widespread vaccine. Um, you know, we're seeing resurgent in cases. I certainly am not interested in, in going and being in a crowded office right now. Um, so I think we have to acknowledge that remote work is here. It's here to stay in the short term for another 12 months or so. And longer term, I think a lot of employers are waking up and realizing, wow, this kind of works. Um, so I think a lot of people who are knowledge workers uh, is going to have increased flexibility post pandemic to, to work wherever. Um, and that's something that people have been have been advocating for for a while. And I think this just has accelerated that change. Um, so it's really Thank important. You. To, yeah. And so it's it's just important then to go, okay, this is a reality. We are going to have people who are permanently, you know, distributed. How do we make it work? How do we set them up to succeed with, you know, not just we'll mail you a laptop, but here's who to talk to about these topics. Here's yeah. some checklists. Um, you know, here's how we collaborate. Here's the tools that will support you to do that. One thing I think about, so I totally agree. I, first of all, I don't think we're going into the office at NewsCred, uh, maybe not even this year, uh, and I've guided my team towards that. Uh, one, one thing I've noticed is our, our very successful customers use uh, our CMP or our, those who are using us for marketing work management, they use the, the software almost as the institutional memory uh, for their marketing organization. So it's much easier to onboard a new person um, or even if there's, you know, someone who's already on the marketing team, but they are going to get involved in a campaign. It used to be a very slow and frustrating experience to kind of bring someone over the wall to get them up to speed to educate them because it would become like an archaeology experiment to try and go <laughs> find like artifacts and assets and where's the brief and where's the latest plan oh it's in someone's spreadsheet that's in someone's inbox and this person's out of work or out of out of the office so like now we need to wait until they come back and so using a collaborative tool it's not just process improvement as you know we've talked about but it could serve as the place where you house a lot of the briefs the campaign strategies the kind of the assets that you need for new hires, the assets that you need for folks who you're onboarding into this, these campaigns. So it can serve as institutional memory for your marketing org, which I, I thought that was an interesting way to think about it. And we've noticed a lot of our customers do that. Um, one question, Marsha, you mentioned that, that, that company that uh, kind of streamlined process to really accelerate the velocity of content creation and then got better results as a res uh, because of that. Um, I'm assuming they use some sort of technology, whether it's a CMP or something similar, is that right? That is correct, yes. And they said that was absolutely integral to their success. They needed a, a shared um, kind of system of record for marketing Fantastic. where you know, the work could be assigned, it could be tracked, they could have their backlog, they could have their plans. Um, what was really great, though, is that uh, as they went through uh, their process improvement and, and adopting Agile, is they gave the team a lot of feedback. So, so part of, of the Agile method is to make sure your team has ownership of their work and they can make decisions. But they also solicited the team about, you know, what's the process you use? How can you make mm -hmm. it better? How can we set the tool up to support you to do this? And that's been just a huge part of their success. Got it. Okay, you kind of preempted uh, an answer that there was a question that came in, you know, when someone is implementing a, some, a digital CMP tool, uh, any recommendations for an approach to assess or evaluate kind of team specific processes before we visualize the big picture, right? So I think you, you mentioned one example, which is, you know, maybe for each team, they can 
do some sort of retrospective around like what's going well, what's working, what's not working for the existing process and kind of document in a very, using some of those agile principles of retrospectives and coming up with like, uh, you know, improvements to their, their process. Any other guidance on like the kind of the, what the question is around mini team specific process. How do you assess or evaluate? Yeah, the, the, um, the summer you just gave was was fantastic. Um, I'm working with a, a different client organization. It's doing a process improvement and an agile rollout at a scale and a pace that literally is is lifting the top of my head. It's it's really impressive. And um, the uh, very passionate marketing operations leader who's running that effort, um, she said she spends about, between her and her, her, co her colleague in, in this effort, about 200 hours per team in marketing to make sure that they're comfortable with, the, with talking about process, make sure that they have you know, really hard conversations about their process, what is what working, what's not, what's upstream, where do they run into problems, um, all of that gets documented. She works with the team on the tool that they have selected to make sure that it is comfortable for how they work and she'll make adjustments. Um, she coaches them on what they need to do as they go forward with Agile. And then she sits in on the, some of their early ceremonies, their, their stand-ups, their mm -hmm. planning sessions, their retrospective to nip any, um, you know, to answer questions and nip any behavior that goes over the line. And that investment, you know, that, that, that focus on each team as they start to adopt it has just paid huge dividends. Um, and they had a very interesting strategy where they went through and enabled individual marketing teams. Then when everyone was comfortable and had done their own internal process improvements, they then started tackling cross-functional process for marketing. And that's gone very rapidly because they're starting from a, a common foundation. Great. Well, thank you for that. And yeah, I think Sabrina asked a question um, around that CMP implementation. And so the only other guidance I would give is, you know, make sure you don't just replicate offline processes into the tool. That's a big mistake that we've seen and we covered that. And then also, I think to the point that we were just talking about, you know, each team is different. So we really recommend team or persona based both configuration, but also team and persona based training and kind of that feedback loop as well. Um, so the, the other thing uh, that I would add to that, and, and Shafkat, you mentioned this a little earlier, when I did a, a implementation of an MRM years ago, I had people wanting to make the process the most perfect thing in the world for every possible scenario. And people weren't thinking the 80%, they were thinking the 20% special cases. So when we first implemented it, everyone's like, oh my God, this is cumbersome. And we ended up after all this work to document this huge, this is how we take build campaigns and it had bells and whistles and everyone went to like a five step, much simpler process <laughs> that worked for the vast majority very, of the situations. Very, very true. We often see people when they first use our software, they're like, oh my God, I can set up you know, multi-step workflow with, you know, sub steps and parallel and sequential. And they, they want to use all the bells and whistles until they realize that, you know, it, the technology is there to make their life easier, not to make it more complex. And, and so there's an opportunity to kind of make it streamlined versus make it more complex, even though the technology offers both options. And we always end up going down in terms of the number of steps and then never going up. Exactly. Um, and so, you know, there's some learnings there and, you know, never let, you know, perfect get in the way of good enough, like get started. And then you'll iterate on those workflows as you implement and learn. So for sure. Um, maybe one last question. This one's a little bit more technical or technology related. You know, Zoom is great, but how do we create collaboration, cohesive and creativity working from home? Um, you know, from a, from a collaboration, cohesiveness, visibility, which is a big pain point we hear, obviously any sort of CMP or work management tool, I think can help. Uh, I'm biased, but that, that is, that is an answer that, you know, for us as a whole company, 200 people, we went remote all of a sudden in March. Um, and we run our entire company, all initiatives, projects, workflows, everything runs through our CMP. Um, and we use it as a kind of a work management solution outside of even marketing. As an example, our people ops team uses our intake forms 
uh, for requests for like HR or hardware or software or benefits. And we didn't need those before because you could just walk up to someone at their desk and ask for something. Right. And so right. it's really amazing that if you're resourceful, you can, you can use this kind of, um, you know, these sor sorts of tools to not just provide visibility, but really um, digital, digitally transform all processes in the company, or at least a lot. Um, I, there was a question around Zoom fatigue. Um, I'll just end on this one because it's, it's not really a process or a technology answer. Uh, but someone asked, like, Zoom is great, but I'm just Zoomed out with so much fatigue. Uh, I agree. And you know what I did? This is, again, a personal answer, which is uh, as the CEO of a company, I thought I could just continue the same pace that I had pre-pandemic online. Um, six hours of meetings, seven hours of meetings a day, nonstop, back to back, 30 minute. And at the end of the first week, I was completely shattered. And so my only uh, kind of solution to that is take lots of breaks. So now I schedule a long lunch break. I finish early. I take breaks in the middle. And without it, I think it's just too much there. And there's a lot of research into why Zoom is so much more exhaust exhausting. Uh, I'm sure if you Google it, we can send it out. But that's just a pro-life tip. It's made the quality of my life a lot better. Um, <laughs> So we're, we're um, pretty much out of time. We have two minutes left. One thing I will do is just thank everyone for joining. Um, I think you can still see my screen. Just very quickly, if you're wondering what we do at NewsCred, we are a work management solution. So, you know, some of the, a, a lot of what, you know, we talked about today, literally what we solve every single day. But we, we agree with Marsha in that, you know, technology is not a silver bullet. We're there to help assist and transform these marketing organizations that already believe that they can and want to and have the willingness to change, to invest in process, to invest in process improvement. Uh, if you have that as a cultural ethos, then I think a solution like ours really um, can, can help. And, you know, we're purpose built for marketers. We're not generic project management. Uh, so really everything we've done is focused on you know, market it, marketers from the UI to the UX to, uh, you know, it's not project management. We allow for campaign management. Um, we really focus on content production and content workflows. It's very easy to use. And for all steps of the marketing process. So, you know, whether it's intake forms and prioritizing and routing work, whether it's planning, budgeting, the content creation and execution, or publishing and distributing the content and measuring it, um, we really support all aspects of the end-to-end -end marketing ecosystem. And so if anyone uh, is curious or wants to know more or wants to hear any stories, uh, even if you are using a different software, you're not going to hurt my feelings. Uh, if you just want tips or advice on like, hey, how do we just make this implementation go smooth? Or, hey, we're running into some challenges. Any advice? or best practices, I'm happy to personally share uh, any of those. Um, certainly if you're in the market for any of these solutions or use cases, we would love to chat. Um, and then more importantly, uh, if you have follow-up questions on any of the stuff that Marsha presented today, um, we will share the deck, we'll share the video as well. Um, I'm sure there's lots of frameworks that Marsha has in her back pocket that she'd be happy if you if you want to engage with uh, Marsha or the team there at Sirius at Forrester, um, please do. Uh, but with that said, uh, I think we're going to wrap because it's the top of the hour. For any unanswered questions and any unanswered questions we got in advance, um, we will send you a quick answer via email post um, post this webinar, you know, for example, someone asked around courses for agile methodology and et cetera. So like, we'll try and answer as many of those as possible. Um, with that said, I'm gonna uh, say thank you again to Marsha uh, for joining us, for uh, your presentation, for the interactive nature. I also thought you were really funny, which is a nice change uh, from all the webinars that I sent, sit in. Um, and thank you to our audience for joining. Yes, thanks everyone for being here today. It's, it's, it's great to have some virtual connection. Absolutely, it's, uh, it's our pleasure to set it up. So uh, have a good day, be well, take care of yourselves, take care of your families and take care of your communities. So uh, with that, we'll sign off.